This week on the Back Table Podcast. You mentioned not to oversize too much. Is there a percentage that you keep in your head as far as how much? Do you just try to be one-to-one? Do you try to oversize or do you undersize? Well, I think the whole definition of how you actually size becomes important uh, as well. Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. it's. Uh, I tend to be on dissections. I tend to be a little bit more inner wall to inner wall uh, because I want to just cover the entry tear. I don't really, it's not an aneurysmal disease. Uh, you, you typically don't get endo leaks on the proximal neck uh, if you've got enough coverage. So I tend to be inner wall to inner wall. If it's the acute, uh, like I said, I tend to go off the IVUS. The problem with IVUS, when you get up in that arch, you've got a pretty big curve and you get more of an elliptical structure rather yeah. than a than a, a, a true exactly. orthogonal angle. So you, you, I'll look at the minor axis of that of that IVUS image. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and more. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Backtable.com, or any other podcast platform you enjoy. RadPad radiation protection products, developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See RadPad.com for more information and contact info at RadPad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. I'm Sabine Dond as your host this week, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, vascular surgeon Dr. Frank Arco, coming to us from Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome, Frank. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, the pleasure's ours. I mean, um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I mean, how did you develop your passion for aortic work and then land up in uh, North Carolina? Well, that's uh, probably a good little story. I would say that, um, you know, I, when I went to medical school, I always had sort of a passion for uh, for really surgery. And um, I sort of wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Or my father said, you know, you should think about orthopedic surgery. He's a general surgeon. And then when I got in the medical school, I, I did some NIH work um, on the cardiovascular system. So really thought I wanted to be a be a heart surgeon. And then when I went through my general surgery and residency training, I really sort of enjoyed vascular surgery more, really always liked the aorta, mostly aneurysmal disease. And I went off to Stanford where they had a very large um, sort of aortic practice. That's really why I went there. You know, a very strong team of surgeons, vascular surgeons, cardiac surgeons, radiologists, and the innovation that was going on there at the time was uh, was really incredible. I think I really hit it at the right time. I had the opportunity to work with uh, Mike Dake, um, Charlie Simba, you know, back in the day. A co-fellow of mine as a rate, uh, IR was uh, Rusty Hoffman. I was the yeah. vascular surgery <laughs> fellow and a uh, great team of surgeons and, and Craig Miller, Scott Mitchell, uh, Neil Alcott, and, and Chris Zarens. And I, I would say that's really where I developed my sort of knowledge and passion for, for thoracic aortic disease. And ever since then, I sort of just really liked it. When I finished my fellowship, I sort of stayed there at Stanford. I stayed on faculty there for about four or five years. Um, I was in the process of developing some stuff with Tom Fogarty, working with a lot of uh, different companies on stink graft designs, uh, mainly mainly Medtronic. But you know, I I grew up in California, but I was I was married, still married, um, and my wife was from Texas, and so she always really wanted to get back to to Texas. And so when an academic opportunity came up, uh, I said I'd, I'd take a look. And so actually one year, both Houston as well as Dallas came open. And the reason I really liked Dallas a little bit more than Houston was at the time, you know, Houston had a pretty well-developed aortic practice, some very big names that most people around the world know. And I wasn't sure I really wanted to get into that sort of competitive environment, having to yeah. work against uh, some very, very strong names and, and very, very good surgeons. But Dallas didn't really have the same thing. And as an academic center, it was a very good academic center. And I wanted to test my ability to, you know, I sort of inherited a practice at Stanford uh, from some people that retired or went on sabbatical. And I wanted to see if I could build my own sort of thoracic practice mm -hmm. and uh, actually was able to do that. And then when I was there between both at Stanford 
as well as in Dallas, Texas, both places I was in these, you know, very well-known academic centers. But frankly, I was surrounded by very large systems. In California, uh, in Stanford, I was surrounded by basically Kaiser everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in Dallas, I was surrounded by Baylor, which is now Baylor Scott and White. And that is the largest system in, in Texas. And what I really saw was those two systems were really, you know, managing, if you will, the patient population. In an academic center that I was at, I was really sort of obligated to getting whatever the the systems that were around me were willing to sort of send my way, which was nice because that, you know, allowed me to develop a very sort of complicated practice. But if I really wanted to go to the next level and, you know, have a have a much larger disease process to manage, I really sort of felt that I needed to go into sort of a system. And, you know, at the time in Dallas, I was really looking to look for a chief job. I had some chief jobs, and I interviewed here at uh, Carolinas Healthcare, which is now Atrium Health, which is part of Sanger Heart and Vascular. And when I got here, what I saw was, uh, one, it was a truly collaborative heart and vascular institute. So it had cardiologists, a lot of them. Uh, I had some cardiac surgeons and had vascular surgeons. Didn't have IR. The IR is a, sort of a separate group, and we have a nice working relationship with, with that Charlotte radiology. But I really want to sort of be in, a, in an institute. And the system, I, I thought, was that sort of on the verge of sort of burgeoning out and, and getting much bigger. I had some friends in the area that sort of told me like they thought that this system was really going to be taking off. And so, you know, I came here and I mean, the system has really done everything that I thought it was going to do and probably even a little bit more than what I thought it was going to do. But the ability to, to manage, if you will, the aorta from a, from a part of the Carolinas, so the Western Carolinas, part of South Carolina, a little bit of Tennessee, and even a little bit of Georgia, uh, really allows us to put in protocols in place, find the disease quicker, manage it a little bit better, and then sort of follow these patients systemically long-term to try to really improve their long-term outcome. So that's really how I got here, and I got to tell you, like, I really enjoy it. That's amazing. That's a lot of big names. That's an amazing, you know, way to come into this aorta world. And now you're the aortic guy. I mean, aside from the aorta, you're, you're, you're a man of many talents. I mean, I enjoy seeing the, all the music you post. I mean, if it wasn't for medicine, would we be seeing you live on stage? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, when I was younger, I was, uh, my, I loved music. I actually played a lot more music back then. I played in a guitar. I played classical guitars. So I played in a classical guitar quartet uh, from probably about the age of eight to about, you know, probably about 16. And that's when I sort of veered off into more sort of like punk grunge type <laughs> music. And, um, you know, I did that all through college. It's actually how I met my wife. Uh, was really through music. And then, you know, medicine really got me away from music. I didn't really play it. I would actually buy instruments. Um, I one time bought a very, I played piano too. And then also I played, I played drums. So in the band that we formed, I actually started as the guitarist, but moved over to the drummer, uh, mainly because we couldn't find a drummer. And, and then when I got married and I started having kids and we didn't have much money and I didn't have much space, my wife sort of made me get rid of a lot of the instruments that I had. There were a few that I just said, there's no way they're, they're, they're leaving, but I did have to get rid of the drum set and I had to get rid of keyboards and things like that. But then when I started having kids, they sort of got interested in music. We put them into lessons and stuff, but they just said, um, we're not having any of that. So they didn't, they did about two, three weeks of lessons. I grew up in, in lessons all the time. And then they sort of developed a love for it and it, it brought me back to, to playing music. So that's, what I do. I, I now have a drum set. Again, you've never seen me play the drums. Yeah, we're going to see that now. We got we got to see that on, on a, a video post <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, soon, soon. Awesome. No, that that's great. Uh, so we'll, we'll go, we'll start our topic about type B aortic dissections, uh, TBAD, you know, if, if uh, people see we uh, post that uh, acronym online, but how much of your practice is thoracic aortic work? I'd say uh, the amount of thoracic aortic work that I do is probably in about the 15 to 20 percent range of my entire practice. Okay. Uh, if, if if you had to define it as aorta, I'd probably say it's about 30 or 35 percent. Got it. 
Got it. And then how much of that is open versus endovascular? You know, I'd say that it used to be about uh, 80 to 90% endovascular and about 15 to 20% open. I would say that my open is starting to creep up uh, okay. a little bit more, uh, probably maybe about 75, 25. It's probably due to the fact that I'm getting referred a lot of complex stuff, sort of failed endovascular stuff. And, you know, as, as you've been in it for a, a long period of time, been doing, I've been doing endovascular stuff for, uh, let's see, 20, 22 yeah. years. Yeah. And so when you've been doing it for 22 years, you start to see the failure mechanisms of th some things. And you think that, well, you know, maybe you can get through these things. And to be honest, we, the majority of the time you can get through it from an endovascular standpoint. But I would say that I've become a little bit more conservative in the younger, healthier patient with sort of uh, anatomy that's not very conducive to endovascular repair, maybe doing them open a little bit more and really having pretty good results with it. Yeah, no, I'm sure you see some of the most complex and also some really bad failures and uh, definitely open. That's great that your open practice is also increasing. You know, I, I wanted to kind of start off with some definitions for our listeners, uh, especially for those that are not as familiar um, with type B dissections. I mean, what's... Um, what are some kind of vocabulary you use to describe type B aortic dissections? What is it and what are some vocabulary? Well, I'd start with two. So if you're going to talk about dissections, I talk about first type A and type B. I think that's one that you need to understand. I think that uh, makes it relatively simple. I went to Stanford, so I'm going to use just the Stanford mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. the DeBakey. I think the DeBakey is a little bit more difficult to understand and define. So, you know, yeah. uh, I, I really focus on the on the B and, and maybe the residual B following the type A. It's just a difference in where the, the tears occur. So I, I train a lot of fellows and residents and I get to be a little bit of a stickler in some of the nomenclature for the repairs. Oftentimes when someone's younger and talking to you about, you know, a dissection, they're like, well, I got a symptomatic dissection. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or I got a symptomatic dissection, you know, with a, with a lot of pain. And the first thing I said, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to get in the world of the dissections, the first thing you need to really talk about is the complicated versus the uncomplicated. Yes. Now you can get into a whole lot of definitions about whether those are even good terminology. And to be honest with you, I, I have some problems with the complicated versus the uncomplicated nomenclature, but I think that is most important. The uncomplicated, really, they just have a dissection, and they don't really have much in the way of anything else causing them a problem. I think the number of those patients that have the truly uncomplicated dissection, I think they're there, but they're relatively infrequent when you really start to take a look at the imaging and, and how the patients are being managed. I find that there are a number of complicated dissections that would get downgraded, if you will, into the uncomplicated in patients who have ischemia to a kidney. I see this one all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's low flow to one of the kidneys. Typically, it's the left. The patients are being managed, but now they're on like four or five antihypertensive agents. They're pain-free. The creatinine has gone from, you know, normal 0 0.9 to 1.3, 1.4, and then they're sort of downgraded in this uncomplicated dissection. Now, are they as complicated as someone who's got occlusion of the SMA? No, no, you don't have to. It's not an emergent procedure, uh, but probably should be managed because the long-term effectiveness of therapy of and whatever that therapy may be, whether it's TVAR versus TVAR plus or minus a petticoat versus TVAR with a renal stent. So I tend to be, the older I get, tend to be a little bit more aggressive in managing the visceral arteries, visceral renals in those sort of complicated dissections to try to improve the long-term outcomes of those patients. So I think that's really the biggest key. Then you take your uncomplicated and you take your high risk categories. So size of the aneurysm, you know, is it greater than four, 4.5? What's the size of that true lumen uh, versus the false lumen, the ratio, the size of the false lumen, you know, if it's greater than 22 millimeters, you know, is that's sort of portends a, a worse outcome. And in those high risk features, we have a tendency to really treat those patients a little bit 
earlier than later. I think, you know, the problem with treating these patients is you have to sort of weigh the risk benefit ratio. And when you look at that, you know, there's three, there's three things that they take on when you fix them from an endovascular standpoint, right? So there's mm -hmm. good data to show that medical management is probably better than emergent surgical therapy. There is good data. Uh, the mortality is just too high with open surgical repair. There's not a great randomized prospective study comparing medical therapy versus, versus TVAR. There's data that really didn't show much in the early phase, but there's probably an improvement in the long-term outcomes of those patients, basically the NSTED XL trial. The problem with treating the patients and where everyone's concern comes up from is, to me, these three risk factors when you fix them. Retrograde type A dissection, which basically turns you into medical therapy, now a sternotomy. There's a risk of stroke when you treat them. I think depending on you know, the zone that you're treating, who's treating them, how many you've treated, that risk will vary probably somewhere between four to eight to 10%. Mm -hmm. Those strokes typically are not major disabling strokes. They're typically minor non-disabling strokes, but they're still strokes and we don't know the long-term outcomes of those. And then lastly, the risk factor that everyone is greatly concerned about is spinal cord ischemia, paralysis. And to me, the worst of those three is really paralysis. I mean, non-disabling stroke is bad. If you've got a retrograde dissection and you, and you manage it from a team standpoint, you've always got a cardiac surgeon on board involved. You have to have mm -hmm. that uh, for that complication. Then I think the, the mortality or the bad outcomes from that is, is not terrible. I mean, if you catch it early, they can be repaired and fixed, and they usually do okay. Spinal cord ischemia and paralysis, I mean, that is just a dreaded complication. It's happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's happened to me with open surgery. It's happened to me immediately after. It's happened to me delayed for four weeks after I did TVAR. And the problem with that is if they get permanent paralysis, it really is just a very, very tough way to live for someone who's older. And mm -hmm. the risk of mortality long term in those patients is, is relatively high, especially in the first six months after. If we can figure out how to minimize or eliminate those three sort of major complications, then I think you can get into the role of everybody that has a dissection type B should maybe undergo TVAR. But until we can sort of eliminate those or minimize those three things, that's why you will, I think, continuously have this argument over medical therapy, optimum medical therapy versus early TVAR, whether it's in the acute phase, the subacute phase, or the chronic phase. As a surgeon who, who sees more the the chronic, and so again, you get in these sort of definitions, acute, so in the first 14 days, get to subacute, and that definition changes. So depending on uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria or uh, varying guidelines, it could range from 14 days to 30 days or up to 90 days. And then you got the chronic, which is longer than that. The problem with those definitions as well is because they start to talk about the lamella or how the how the tear is and what you can do from the endovascular standpoint versus open surgery is then getting into that chronic dissection. So I want to treat the early stuff to try to minimize someone getting to the chronic phase. That chronic phase in which it becomes the dissection that has now become aneurysmal from an endovascular standpoint really becomes a complex repair, no matter who's doing it, and even if you've done a lot. And the reason for it is, is the top part's all the same. Nothing changes. Yeah. It's, it's cover the entry tear. You typically have a normal neck. Maybe you've got to cover the left subclavian. Maybe you got to do a bypass or, you know, revascularize the left subclavian, however you want to do it, uh, whether it's with a fenestrator graft, an insight to repair or, or surgical bypass. The problem gets on the bottom side. Exactly. And when you come to the bottom side, sometimes I think you almost take the chronic dissection that's been slowly getting aneurysmal because you got a you got the inflow and then you got reentry tears down at the bottom. Sometimes when you go in with the chronic phase, you go up to the top, 
you cover the entry tear, but you don't have any ability to sort of fix the stuff on the bottom. And when that happens, I think in a, in a select group of patients, you get this sort of just a entry flow, but is now on the bottom. And you start to see this a little bit more rapid increase in size of the, of the thoracic aorta. So then you got to get in that more complex repair of a, of a four vessel fenestrator graft. That becomes a very difficult repair uh, in anyone's hands. And so if we, if I think what happens, if we can treat those earlier ones, we minimize those operations that are needed in the chronic phase. And what happens is in the chronic phase, you never eliminate the three risk factors that you take if you fix them early. You still have that risk of stroke, you still have that risk of retrograde, and you still have the risk of spinal cord ischemia. So that's why I like to treat more and more type Bs earlier to eliminate that risk of needing that more difficult complex repair. I think most large institutions can treat and treat well the type B aortic dissection. What's, you know, certain mm -hmm. protocols and instruction and, and doing it as a team system. When you get in that more complex repair, that type two thoracoabdominal, which is from the dissection, mm -hmm. that I think is probably limited to about 15 to 20 centers, maybe more uh, within the U.S. that actually can really do it well. The problem with that is just patients like this all over the United States trying to seek places to go and you know then they can't afford to get where they need to go and they want to do it yeah. wherever it's being done and maybe you know physicians are can say oh i think i can do it but i haven't done that many but patients want to do it and i think you get into issues with sort of outcomes specifically mortality and spinal cord ischemia yeah. uh, and in those patients being treated at not large volume centers yeah, I mean, I mean, these cases can be real complex, uh, you know, a, a simple type B, sure, that can be easier to fix, but these complex ones should not be treated at a low volume center. So you, you mentioned a lot, a lot of vocabulary there. So that's great. I mean, uh, we're going to touch base on all of that. I you, you mentioned entry tears, your workup, I, I think all, all of us agree that the CTA is kind of your, your main workup on a on a type B dissection. Is there is there any other imaging modality use like echo or MRI? Uh, I don't use much in the way of MRI or MRA. I do get echoes on every patient that has uh, has a dissection. Uh, one, you can take, you got to make sure that their aortic valve is okay. Uh, you can take a look a little bit at their A setting, take a look at what the um, diastolic and systolic function of the heart is. Uh, you can look and see if they've got uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, when I treat the patients, the only other imaging that I tend to get is uh, I use IVIS in all my patients, mm -hmm. which sort of helps me identify what the flap is, make sure I'm not in the false lumen when I want to be in the true lumen. Those are the three main imaging studies that I get. Okay. And I mean, patient comes, you know, say the acute or hyperacute phase to the ER, initial medical management, what's your, what are the BP goals um, that, that you kind of want to keep your patient at? Sure. So when we get someone, we will typically admit them to an ICU. Uh, we've got a very mm -hmm. good working relationship with our uh, pulmonary critical care uh, team. We tend to use just the AHA guidelines. So the first thing we want to do is actually drop the heart rate down. Uh, we try to get it in the 60 range if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, that's typically managed with Esmolol. And then for the blood pressure, we want to get that down uh, typically in about the 120 systolic range. Uh, if we can, uh, we'll use Esmolol for that. If we need as a secondary drug, we will tend to use Cardine. Got it. Now, the one thing that we will do when we initiate that, in, and we we probably treat about 70 to 80 dissections on a yearly basis, is we want to try to start initiating oral medications on those patients as soon as possible. Uh, we will typically go with a, with a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, the Norvas, and then an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. The one important thing to remember is trying to be that aggressive with the medical therapy is there are some patients who just cannot tolerate that blood pressure. 
because they've just been used to a much higher blood pressure. So they'll get some cerebral hypoperfusion. Uh, you might start to see them uh, become a little bit confused. You might actually start to see their creatinine uh, rise. And if you see that stuff, then you really need to lighten up on the medications. That would be also another indication for us to treat those patients a little bit earlier uh, so that we can relax on the blood pressure medications. Got it. Uh, any other high-risk anatomical, I mean, you talked about uncontrollable BP. Uh, what about pleural effusion or uh, an aortic size? Pleural effusion worries me. They tend to typically have a, a pain with that. I don't think that they're at a, you know any real risk of rupture unless the size of the aneurysm is getting bigger and you can't control their pain and they have a pleural effusion. Then I get a little bit more worried. I see a lot of patients who I can get into that sort of uh, uh, no pain uh, with relatively easy medical therapy that may still have a pleural effusion. And that pleural effusion will typically go away. Now, if the size of the aneurysm is big and it's 4.5 mm -hmm. or 5, then I get a little bit more concerned that they're going to be at some sort of impending risk of rupture. It's relatively rare, but I think it, it can occur. And when you talked about treating patients earlier, I mean, that's the big debate for, you know, non-heart indications like rupture or malperfusion. When is your ideal time frame that you like to treat these patients? Is it three days, 10 days, two weeks? Maybe someone who has some of these high risk clinical features, but is otherwise, well, as we said, they fit in that zone that's complicated. Yeah. If they're in the complicated section, then I just, I, I tend to treat them uh, relatively quickly. It would, it would depend on the level of the complicated section. So for me, if they've got leg ischemia, SMA ischemia or spinal cord paralysis, you're going to get an operation right away. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. if you're coming in and you've got a rising creatinine, you've got some sort of low flow to that left kidney, I'm probably going to treat you at about the five to seven day range. And that would be the complicated section. Of course, if they're ruptured, that's, that's immediate. If you're getting someone who's coming in, they got uncomplicated section, but they have high risk features. So yeah, large. Exactly large false lumen, uh, if they have continued pain, um, mm -hmm. I think they need to be treated before they leave. If their aneurysm is probably greater than five or so, I have a tendency to treat them a little bit earlier. And we evolve this sort of on a constant basis. If you know, if sure. you, if, and a lot of it's based on data. If you take a look at the data that's out there, is if you treat them in the more acute phase or hyperacute phase, you have a little bit higher risk of having some complications, mainly the retrograde type A dissection, I think is the biggest one. So we like to try to get them normotensive, non-pain-free, out of the hospital if we can, and then we will try to treat them at about four to six weeks or really after 30 days. And you okay. start to take a look at all sorts of different stuff. So we're looking at readmission rates uh, within 30 days for patients. Every physician is looking at that. Every hospital is looking at that. And one of our biggest readmission rates is actually the type B dissection in which we manage medically, discharge home, and then they come back three, four days later because now they're having pain. pain. And if, they, yeah. if you come back with pain, we're, we're then going to treat you. But those patients are typically the patients that have some high-risk features like we mentioned. So I would say mm -hmm. I'm and we as a group are – tending to become a little bit more aggressive in those high-risk patients and treating them earlier before discharge rather than later. Got it. Yeah. That aorta and that acute phase, you know, is fragile. And you mentioned the retrograde dissections are what you worry about, among other things. In a patient who you have to treat acutely, they're coming in, they have rupture or, mal or, or you know, malperfusion that's, that's requiring treatment then and there. What are some tips um, that you do uh, that uh, you try to avoid the complications like a retrograde dissection or stroke? Do you, you know, get in and out? Do you, do you just do T-VAR? Do you dabble in the pedicode in that or, or use any adjunct techniques? I think those are great questions. I think it's a little bit dependent upon what I'm seeing when I get in there. Yeah. I think that if you're if you've got the complicated dissection, I think about 15 to 20 percent of those patients will need some sort of adjunctive techniques. I guide everything as I go in, so I don't go into the procedure saying I'm going to do th these five things. I I start in the 
process of what I'm going to do, re-image, and then decide what needs to be done next. So if you come in, I need to treat you hyperacutely. First, I want to get your blood pressure appropriate, so appropriate anti-impulse therapy. Depending on the level that I have to go up to, so if I have to cover the left subclavian, uh, I may or may not pace you. Uh, so I like to deploy under pacing. I just think it can be a little bit more accurate. We do mm-hmm. some type A dissections as well uh, with with TVAR and some ascending work. And so getting the ability to do TVAR before you have to get to that stage and understanding how to do it, I think is a, a nice bridging to get to the next level if you want to go into zone one or zone zero. Yeah. So pacing, I think, is is sometimes important to IVIS through the case, so pre, post, and then deciding what you want to do next. To minimize that risk of retrograde type A dissection, I typically will tend to base my imaging off of IVIS. And again, if it's hyperacute and they come in with a blood pressure like 220, the thoracic aorta is much bigger. So I think you tend to oversize too much. So when you get them in appropriate anti-impulse therapy, you go back in there, IVIS them, their aorta is maybe 30, 31, rather than 40 or 42 when they come in. So we can then decrease the size of the stent graft. Because if you're putting in 40, 42 stent grafts in dissections, you really raise the risk of retrograde type A dissection. So I, I think IVIS is important. When you come in and you talk about petticoat, I haven't been – I think there's certainly a need for petticoat in certain patients. It's typically when the true lumen remains completely compressed to the visceral segment and the infrarenal. Uh, there have been some times, maybe once a year, uh, and this was pre the petticoat when it was FDA approved, so it was approved outside the U.S. first, where we would have to put stents through that visceral segment to get it open. Mm-hmm. But I'd say it's like 1% or 2% for that. I find that if we just go up, do the T-VAR, we get pretty good expansion of the true lumen all the way through the visceral segment. We tend to be a little bit more aggressive in the amount of thoracic coverage that we do, and this has, again, been a little bit of my own uh, evolution over 22 years where I used to go in and put one piece. You hear people talk about it. So I just put in a single 10 piece for the T-VAR, cover the entry tear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I sort of used to do that, but then I, I'd, I'd be back at like six weeks, eight weeks because I'd have, you know, aneurysmal degeneration distal to that because I, I was deploying in the still disease segment through the mid thoracic aorta. They talk about stent graft induced new entry tears. It's not from yeah. the stent graft, it's just disease. So I now have a tendency to go further down. I tend to go about two to three centimeters above the celiac. Okay. You get into more normal aorta. I think you also get much better aortic remodeling, thoracic, long-term. But then you bring in a little bit of risk of increased spinal cord ischemia. We haven't really seen that there, but, you know, we certainly have it. We can usually recover it. Uh, but the data in China, in which they've got a lot, when they've gone down that far, had a slightly increased risk of spinal cord ischemia. So when you become a little bit more aggressive, you have to manage that complication. Mm-hmm. Then once I do that, then I sort of take a look at the visceral segment, sort of see what's going on. I tend to be a little bit aggressive on treating the viscerals and the renals. So if I see something that's even a little bit dynamic obstruction, uh, or if you have a static obstruction, I'm going to treat you for sure. But I will typically go in and put in a stent. I like to use covered stents uh, in those areas. Uh, One, the vessels are big, they track easily, but with the covered stents, there's usually some fenestrations there that you can cover and Mm -hmm. you can sort of get better aortic remodeling if you can shut off that uh, reentry flow into the false lumen off a visceral or a renal. And then lastly, if I had to, you know, I, I put a petticoat in, but that's like, you know, one, two, three, maybe at most 4% for me. I think there's more and more people putting it in. Um, you know, maybe it's fine. Maybe I'm missing the charge on that one a little bit. But in my own practice, I haven't really felt the need to use it. What about um, in patients, the more the subacute and chronic ones? Are, are you using the petticoat uh, or stable technique? more often in those patients or just in general you you pretty much you're you're able to you know stent usually to the above the celiac and you'll be okay 
I usually will start first just to the celiac, and then it, even in the uh, chronic ones, I'll just go to the celiac and then see what I get, uh, and then follow them back at four to six weeks if they have a tendency to have uh, increased flow or it's getting worse. And I'd say it's about that 10 or 15% where it just going down the celiac doesn't work. I tend to do more of a branched repair. Got it. Because it's just so many multiple fenestrations. I think if you put a covered... Uh, excuse me, an uncovered stent down to that area, you're still going to have flow through those fenestrations. And I don't know that you're going to get sort of expansion of that true lumen when it's chronic. Yeah. And that flap becomes so thickened when it's chronic. I mean, I'm sure you've seen that even in your open repairs. I mean, that's just, it like becomes leather, you know? Yeah. So how much is this, uh, you know, low radial um, uncovered stent, low low radial force uncovered stent really going to help in those really chronic ones too? We've talked about IVIS and, and sizing. So you mentioned not to oversize too much. Is there a percentage that you keep in your head as far as how much? Do you just try to be one-to-one? Do you try to oversize or do you undersize? Well, I think the whole definition of how you actually size becomes important uh, as well. Yeah. How do you do it? Yeah. it's. Uh, I tend to be on dissections. I tend to be a little bit more inner wall to inner wall uh, because I want to just cover the entry tear. I don't really, it's not an aneurysmal disease. Uh, you you typically don't get endo leaks on the proximal neck uh, if you've got enough coverage. So I tend to be inner wall to inner wall. If it's the acute, uh, like I said, I tend to go off the IVUS. The problem with IVUS, when you get up in that arch, is you've got a pretty big curve and you get more of an elliptical structure rather yeah. than a than a, a, a true exactly. orthogonal angle. So you you. I'll look at the minor axis of that of that IVIS image, and then I look if I had a repeat CT scan after the acute one, then I'll sort of compare that to the CT scan. If it's looking like that's 31 and my minor axis is 31, then you know I'll go with a device that's probably. And again, depends on the device that you have. I, I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not a huge fan of one to one sizing. So if it measures 30. I don't know that I really like putting a 30 graft in, but I probably put like a 32. So I'm just so I got it like a little bit under 10% oversizing. The problem with the one to one sizing is you get a nice repair there, but in some of these patients when they're discharged and there's a, there's a sub select group of patients that get to sections that are typically from illicit drug usage. So whether it's cocaine, methamphetamines, this becomes actually a, it's sort of an interest of mine. But what I see is I bring them in and I treat them with anti-impulse therapy. Their aorta goes down to this 31, 32. I go put in a 32, 34 graft in there and they do great. Then I discharge them home and they're doing good. And then at six weeks, eight weeks, they relapse with uh, mm. with the drug usage, yeah, and they come back in, and now they're bl- they're having another hypertensive crisis at two twenty, two thirty, two forty, and when you scan them with a CTA, what it looks like is it looks like I grossly undersize my endograph, because I you know I had a CT scan that was thirty one, thirty two, I put this thirty two, thirty four, and now I'm being called and I've got a huge type one endo leak, yeah. and all these things because that that arch and the ascending aorta have gone back up to 41, 42 millimeters. And it's sort of just leaking all around my graft. I, I don't have to, I don't have to intervene. I just have to treat them with anti impulse therapy. And when I do that and rescan them, the aorta goes back to normal and then everything looks, looks okay. So I don't know what's worse putting in a too large a graft, taking on the risk of a retrograde dissection or sizing it the appropriate size and having to worry about that, that risk of the drug usage again. I've tried to get a social work type look at these patients with that you know, repetitive use mm-hmm. of drugs to take a look and try to get them into some sort of um, rehab program. This is not my expertise, but something that we can try to minimize that, that recurrent risk over and over. I would say I probably have about 40 or 45 of these patients. Well, if if you take a look at over 11 year period, that's only like four patients per year. So, but they're recurring. And then the other thing is, is those are the ones that have a tendency that after a certain number of those occurrences, they start to have really bad problems, a graft infection. Okay. You know, that's those are ones where you maybe get an erosion into the bronchus, uh, an erosion into the esophagus. Oh. 
and they, they become really, really difficult to manage either from an endovascular standpoint or with a surgical standpoint. So I've been trying to do more and more education on these. I've actually written papers uh, on the on the presentation of those patients, but they are a much, much more difficult group of patients to manage. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've definitely seen it all. I mean, that's an interesting, you know, select patients there that you have this recurrent problem and you have to keep on fixing. We've touched base on, you know, that the feared complication of, of paralysis. I mean, are you putting lumbar drains on all of your T-VARs pre or post or, or what's your approach? I'm a selective drainer of the spinal cord. There's one group that I put in everybody, and that's the type 2 thoracoabdominal aneurysm, which I'm basically mm-hmm. covering from the left carotid uh, down to the iliac bifurcation. Unless that patient is symptomatic or ruptured, that's the case that I tend to stage. So I tend to just do some EVAR work, some work up at the top, like basically an elephant trunk. And then when I connect those two graphs as the third stage, that's when I put the spinal drain in because I will have taken out their entire yeah. thoracic aorta. And the only other patient that I might do that is someone who's got a combined thoracic aneurysm and an infrarenal aneurysm, but I'm not treating them both at the same time, but I'm going to treat the thoracic. Those are ones that I would probably routinely drain their spinal cord. The rest, I tend to be a selective drainer of the spinal cord. I think however you choose to do it is sort of dependent upon where you work and the type of teams that you have involved. So when you're getting into the, the management of dissections, remember, I'm sort of managing, I, I diagnose you, I manage you acutely, I treat you with a T-VAR, and then I follow your repair. But I have to have a whole nother set of teams sort of managing you from when you come in, so I'm not really managing you from a critical care standpoint. I'm surveying you, but I'm not really managing yeah. your hypertension. So I've got cardiologists for that. And then you have these sort of dreaded neuro complications. So I've got a team of neurosurgeons that will put the drain in if I treat you selectively and I have a problem, they'll treat it. But if I'm putting the drain in preemptively, I typically have anesthesia put it in. If they come in and they're on aspirin or Plavix and, and I treated you selectively, I then have to get neurointerventional radiology to put in the drain under under guidance because they're the ones that are most willing to do that with the with the two antiplatelets on board to minimize that risk of epidural hematoma. So there's all of these sorts of things that you have to think about. So when you've got protocols in place and you've got service lines on board with those protocols, I think you can be a selective drainer. If the volume of cases that you're doing is let's say one a month, then you're probably better as an institution to be more of a routine drainer rather than having to call someone at two o'clock in the morning to put in a drain that you've never had to call before. So I think it's dependent upon volume, your system, and the teams that you can develop as to how you want to manage the spinal cord. Got it. Yeah. No, that's a that's good advice, especially for low volume centers. I mean, my center, we're, we're you know a low volume, and, and the types that we treat are pretty straightforward. But we are a routine um, lumbar drain facility. We just do that. But it just um, it's really nice that you've been able to do so much, and that, that being able to selectively drain, you can avoid a lumbar drain in some of these patients. What about connective tissue disorders? Uh, you know, so let's say Marfan's. Someone comes with a with a type B there. Is that someone? Are you going to treat endovascular? Are you you straight only surgical there, or or, or uh, what do you do? I think it's uh, uh you know I've done both. I I think when you get into connective tissue disorders, I think that the data would would say that you should try to avoid endovascular repair. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think endovascular repair can be a component of connective tissue disorders, specifically specifically Marfan's. If they've had prior surgeries, and then you can go stent graft through from graft to graft, and then you can sort of minimize that risk of the stuff in between. Uh, I got to tell you, I've had some I've had some very good results in some type B dissections in patients with Marfan's, but they already had their ascending repaired. But I've seen some some pretty bad failures of stent grafts within connective tissue disorders. There's just a lot of radial force there. 
if if I tend to do it, I would probably use more of the gore graphs for connective tissue mm-hmm. disorders. I tend to be I tend to be more of a valiant Medtronic stent graft, but those are the two that I mainly use. But connective tissue disorders, I think there's a little bit less radial force with the gore graft and creating some complications of dissections. I think if you take someone who's got Marfans and you put in a graft for a type B, I think you have run a very high risk of a retrograde type A uh, dissection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As well as well as uh, and even for aneurysmal disease, you just get you know it'll work for a while, but then you'll sort of get this expansion. And then where the seal zones are, the aorta will get just a little bit looser, and you'll you'll have a tendency to get some leaks proximal or distal. Yeah. And then you go on that ever-ending, you know, trying to fix all these these problems. So, speaking of of, of people that you do treat, I mean, follow up wise, you know, are you getting a CT? Uh, before they're discharged and then how often are you following them from an imaging surveillance um, standpoint and then clinically? Uh, I think it's good. I think if they're a complicated dissection that I treat, I have a tendency to get a CTA before discharge, just to make sure I've got everything sort of fixed up and looks good. If it's more of an uncomplicated dissection that I treat, maybe I treated it you know, at three weeks, four weeks down the road, I tend not to get the CTA prior to discharge. Uh, I then tend to get them a CTA at six weeks. And if it looks okay at six weeks, depending on what I see, I actually for my dissections, I tend to be about an every six month uh, CTA. If I get you out to a year and, and you've got very good remodeling, your th- thoracic aorta is remodeled, but maybe you still have just a little bit of dissection through the visceral segment, but it's frankly not that big or it's a little dilated, 31, 32, I then just tend to follow you on a every 12 month basis. Okay, that's good. And then these adjunct techniques, I mean, how often in your now in your experience, are you going back and treating the false lumen and, and things like that? I mean, is, is it happening often or your, your technique has improved to a degree that that it's not happening as much? I think it's a little bit depend. I'd say it's about 10, 10 to 15 percent of patients where I have to go in and do some further therapy. Uh, that therapy can be endoluminal therapy of the false lumen, which uh, you know I do, but I don't know that we have any sort of real good techniques to, to do it. Uh, he basically, you know, I've given the same talk with Mike Dake and he goes up there and says, you're throwing the kitchen sink at the false lumen. And you don't really have any sort of therapy for the false lumen. We, we attempt to figure things out, which is a lot of what IR has done throughout their entire <laughs> career. Let's, let's figure out what we can do. And I think that's very helpful. I think for the false lumen industry has not done a very good job and trying to develop tools for mm. managing it. But I, I think I think they will with time. I, I think the reason is is because they're still they're still trying to develop the market for for the type B dissection. Yeah. And so they're not seeing the numbers of complications that you have unless you're a high volume center. So long term, it's about 10, 15 percent, probably going to go higher than that as patients live longer. I find it typically occurs more in those patients who just fail to manage their hypertension and that distal segment just grows. Again, you can get in the branch vessel technology, you can get in the false lumen therapy, which will maybe occasionally work, but probably going to work for two, three years. Um, and that's, you know, coils, plugs, making your own plugs, <laughs> yeah. and then just throwing stuff up there in the hopes that it's going to thrombose off. But I think the, the best way to manage it is just complete, you know, reconstruction of that visceral Inferior aorta again, whether it's open surgery, uh, combination of open surgery and endovascular techniques, or just a pure endovascular management for it. Yeah, I mean, you got those B vars and, and and all all kind of complex that we won't go into today. But Frank, this is awesome. I mean, uh, I think this is a really great overview of uh, type B aortic dissections. There's so much more that uh, we can cover and go into more detail that I think we should do as a follow-up sometime, you know, uh, and go more into the complex uh, stuff. But we really, really, really enjoyed having you today. Thank you so much. I learned a ton. Okay. Well, you're welcome. And thanks for having me. Yes, of course. Of course. Thank you. Thank you.